Where do I even begin to describe today's story to you? Honestly, I have no idea. But I will let you know this. If you're not a fan of body horror, then this story might not be for you. But if you can handle a little, little bit of blood and guts, then you are going to be amazed by what you listen to this evening. Truly unique and a true treat for all of you who love my channel. Well, my dear friends, once again, I ask only one thing of you. It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I have to lay low today. My kidneys are at it again. The left one started it, I'm pretty sure. Sent out a few feelers and struck the right one rather viciously. The right one counterattacked with his own tentacles, and they had a boxing match for several minutes before they got tired. I ended up having to drink ten glasses of water to distract them. It seems to have worked for now, though. Though I can't go more than twenty minutes without making a trip to the bathroom. It didn't make my stomach happy. It hates all that extra liquid, but it's a good spot, all things considered. The armistice between all my other organs seems to be holding. My liver and pancreas take parting shots at each other occasionally. My spleen acts jealous of my lungs. My privates are sad about their lack of action. And my appendix is chronically depressed. But everything's staying where they're supposed to be. They accept their positions in the hierarchy for now. But I know it's a tenuous piece at best. They say a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. God, they're right about that. I live my life on the assumption that I'm being watched. If I deviate from that belief, I might as well paint a bullseye on my back. Anyone showing the symptoms I have gets carted off to the government quarantine centres. Even in my own apartment, even living alone, I assume that a passerby might spot me in a compromising moment. Constantly shuttered windows are their own type of giveaway, so I have to rotate the windows to be open where I'm not. I wear baggy clothing out in public, and I only go out when I need supplies. Anything tight-fitting risks showing the minute movements within me, the scuffles and the agitation of my uncooperative organs. I've learned not to panic when I'm out and about, and my organs get into it. Panic generates attention. The kidneys are the worst. The left and the right always on the warpath, each convinced the other doesn't need to exist in my body. I hope to God they never figure out that they're right. Well, I'm still me, so to speak. Everything that I have direct control of obeys me without complaint. My bones and muscles have no issues. My brain is top-notch. It's only the organs attached to my autonomic functions that have a problem behaving themselves. I can hear them complaining in my head, and they complain often. They communicate their moods and their intentions through my nervous system. They're wired into me. I don't think they can read my thoughts, however. They've never acted like they can. I think it's a one-way street which upsets them even more because they have to guess at what I'm thinking. They resent me, and that much is clear. They all think I'm doing a terrible job at running this show. They complain about my favoritism to my heart and lungs. They complain about not getting enough vitamins or minerals. They complain about all the hard work and heavy lifting, even if they're barely being used. They freak out if anything foreign comes their way. And they get upset when something starts to grow that isn't normal. And, well, a few of them are starting to suspect that they're vestigial and basically unnecessary. I have to keep an eye on those ones the most. Find ways to satisfy or distract them from their thoughts. It's not easy. I mean, there's a reason why they're vestigial in the first place. I'd tell them all to go to hell if I wasn't afraid of what would happen if I did. They can't understand me being the bits of tissue they are, but I can never be sure. Half a year ago, they couldn't move. Half a year ago, they couldn't complain. It's the complaining that gets to me the most. These days, they never stop complaining, not for one second. 
There are no earplugs in existence that can block out their incessant voices. Sleep requires drugs or sheer exhaustion, and the better drugs are hard to come by. I managed to stock up on Valium before I went on my sick leave, but I don't like to use it. My organs object to my use of drugs. They accuse me of medicating them against their will. They only sleep when I sleep, and I don't sleep much anymore. I've been on a leave of absence from KVRC News in Los Angeles for about a month now. Family illness. My brother was willing to lie for me and claim he had lung cancer. I'll need some forged medical records if I want to keep my job, but right now, that's the least of my worries. The problem with being an on-scene reporter is that you're on the front lines of the news wars. If anyone's going to get shot, beaten up, or exposed to the flu, it's you. I don't know if my profession contributed to my condition, but I doubt it helped. It certainly didn't help that I was the one to grab an exclusive interview with Patrick Mayer, a.k.a. Patient Alpha. Funny thing was, I thought it would be a career maker at the time. A new and exotic disease for the masses to worry about. What could be better? Not just some new variety of cancer or the newest candidate for a flu pandemic, but something truly odd and freaky. Fear translates into ad revenue, and Stacy, my station manager, loves the revenue. She'd squeezed every contact and pulled in every favor in her arsenal to get that interview. Saying no would have been rude, to say the least. There was concern about contamination and infection and all that crap, as this was an unprecedented condition, but such concerns were pretty minimal. Mr. Mayer was sequestered in his private mansion, a luxury later victims wouldn't have, not even the wealthy. The doctors attending to Mr. Mayer couldn't identify a virulent pathogen or other disease carrier within his body, so they were treating him like the victim and not the cause. Assuming that I observed basic safety protocols, I could be in the room with Mr. Mayer without wearing a full biohazard suit. Sometimes I get the idea in my head that being the objective observer will somehow make me immune to the events occurring around me, as if the fire will not touch me or the madman with a gun will not target me. That may explain why I entered the mayor residence so calmly and nonchalantly, as if this was just another interview with a B-list movie actor. I like to think that I have a better-than-average memory, as well as being a card-carrying stickler for details. But, well, a lot happened that day, and my emotional state at the end of it robbed me of objective memories. I have a video file of the interview that I've revisited 20 times over, a file that I'd probably lose my job over if someone ever found out about it. I keep hoping that I'll glean some insight from it, something that might save me down the road. Oh, so far, all it's done is burn the whole interview into my psyche so thoroughly that on the rare moments I can dream, it's all I can see. Mr. Mayor should have been remembered as a captain of industry, a maker of commercial airliners with an impressive safety record. He should have been remembered as the philanthropist with ten charities to his name, or that billionaire with four ex-wives and three autistic children. He even could have gone with being the guy that supposedly paid off reporters to ignore the potentially business-ending moment when one of his prototype airliners caught fire during testing for no apparent reason. But <laughs> you don't get to choose what you're remembered for, do you? Because the world will always know him as Patient Alpha. Less known for how he lived than how he died. To be fair... I'm taking bets that the same fate awaits me in the end. Though it doesn't show on the video file, his mansion was pretty practical for being a rich man's residence. Very little art, very little gaudy colouring, and very little unused space. He loved cabinets, and placed them everywhere they could fit. Some of them were quite barren, the cabinet itself the point of the interior decor. I never had a chance to poke around in his shelving, but I suspect they would be empty as well. He was filling space with wasted space. There has to be something profound about that. His room was on the second floor. 
his bedroom converted into a miniature hospital wing. He had attendants 24-7, a drug dispensary to rival a pharmaceutical chain and an EKG machine always hooked up to him. The room had a very strong clinical smell, the attendants maintaining as sterile an environment as they could manage. The windows were curtained all the time, the sunlight diffused into a softer spectrum. Mr. Mayer was, essentially, bedridden, a man of African-American descent with little hair on his head, but a sturdy beard on his face. Compared to the deathbed image that I had in mind going in, he didn't seem that bad off at all. He was thinner than was considered healthy, but not gaunt. He smiled at me rather insincerely, not really enthused about my presence. I've wondered what type of deal Stacy had to make to get this cooperation, because until then he had avoided the media like the plague, <laughs> no pun intended. Hello, Mr. Vulture, he said to me. I'm sorry that I'm not quite dead yet, so you won't be able to clean my bones until later. Yes, it was going to be one of those interviews. I introduced my camera person, Jenny, who was already setting up the equipment in the far corner of the bedroom, and then myself. I would have told you more about Jenny if I'd known more about her, but this was our first and last outing together. She quit rather abruptly a day later. <laughs> Can't say I blamed her. Mr. Mayer just licked his lips and said, Look, I don't want you here any more than you probably want to be here, so let's just get to it. I've got too many other things to worry about besides you. Again, I wondered what Stacy had on him. As I've mentioned, he wasn't as squeaky clean as his reputation suggested. She had something pretty juicy on him to get this hostile man to cooperate. That had to be a story by itself, but Stacy had instructed me to concentrate on Mr. Mayer's disease and nothing more. Dirty laundry was expressly off limits unless it's somehow connected to Mr. Mayer's condition. What made the interview harder wasn't just Mr. Mayer's attitude. I sat on a spare folding chair five feet from the edge of his bed, uncomfortably close for my tastes, but it was the optimum distance for the Q&A session. Most of his body was outlined in pearly white sheets, as it was too warm for a comforter, and you could see the movements within him. It was hard to mistake them for breathing or seizures or even a baby's kick. There were slow bulges that undulated like waves in the ocean. There were sudden pokes to the skin that made the man wince, even though he had to be on pain medication. Sometimes his torso would distort outward for a brief moment, as if something was trying to leap out of his body. He might go long minutes in a period of peace and stillness, and then fire off a rapid period of activity for the next ten. There was no pattern to it, no logic. Being the professional I am, I was determined to start at the beginning and work my way to the obvious questions. Besides, Mr. Mayer wasn't even offering a lame joke or excuse for his body's convulsions. My discomfort, and that of Jenny's, almost seemed to please him. He struck me as a man already convinced of his doomed status in life, and that this was supposed to be his own private hell. The public was unwelcome. For the record, his condition was far more advanced than mine. I've studied my own nude body in the mirror every night, looking for such symptoms. I occasionally see a jerk, but that's it. My struggles are still quite internal. I doubt that will last, though. Mr. Mayer's background was well publicized in the media, so I opened with a question regarding the first indications of his illness. The question had struck him as amusing, mostly in the irony department, because he'd thought that this unprecedented medical mystery of his was an attack of appendicitis. A series of sudden and strong pains to his abdomen had forced him to the hospital and the surgeon's table. What the surgeon found was a perfectly pink appendix attempting to dislodge itself from the body's circulatory system, gyrating around like an unhappy slug. It was squeezing itself next to his small intestine, causing the small intestine to react in a slow, aggressive manner. 
Taking out the appendix had required two other surgeons, one of which had to literally hold the small intestine in place while the other doctors extracted the appendix safely. Needless to say, the doctors knew something was up. Ultrasound scans to other parts of his body showed the appearance of ambulatory activity in his organs. Most of these organs had no muscle cells within them, so the fact that they had limited movement was, medically speaking, bat shit crazy. They recommended his continual stay in the hospital, but since his condition wasn't life-threatening, they couldn't force him. They probably couldn't, even if it had been. <sighs> To them, I was a lab rat, Mr. Mayor had said. They would have found a reason to extract my gallbladder or something equally unimportant. They basically ruptured my appendix trying to get it out. It was useless to them. That's why it's better to die rich than poor in my book. At least if you're rich, you can die where you want to. I asked him if he was actually dying. He gave me another smirk and said it was a stupid question. He wouldn't be stuck in bed otherwise. For two years, he'd been watching as his organs became increasingly riled up. The experience was like watching Jeff Goldblum turn into a manfly, all the while realizing that you were Jeff Goldblum. He had a house call making ultrasound specialist pop up every week to check up on his organs. The pictures he created of Mr. Meyer's insides could have been mistaken for a slideshow of life in an aquarium. His liver had grown wiggling tentacles, his bladder was stretching itself out, and his intestines were coiling around each other like a pair of amorous serpents. And those were the less distressing images. Sometimes there was pain, sometimes there wasn't, but all the time there were voices in his head. And the voices complained. God, they always complained. They were damaged, sick, overtaxed and undernourished. They blamed him for all of it. He hadn't lived a clean life. He'd gotten drunk too often, smoked too much and had eaten the wrong foods for much of his life. He'd been stressed most of his adult life and gotten less exercise than he should have. He hadn't taken care of himself for years, but up until now the worst thing that had happened was that he couldn't stay married for longer than four years. That, and some gene in him, made his kids autistic, which had prompted him to get a vasectomy. God, there were complaints about that as well. They're rebelling, Mr. Mayor explained to my baffled face. This isn't some kind of cancer. If it were, I'd have tumours on the warpath as well. This isn't some fancy cold or flu virus, or some exotic bug from the tropics. My organs aren't dying. They're evolving. Self-awareness. That's the key. Not self-awareness like in humans, but the type where a bunch of living cells start to act like an independent life form. Some small part of them must be acting like a brain, Something simple but effective. Evolution might even be the wrong word for it. Evolution implies the act of simple organisms coming together to create more developed biological systems and higher forms of life. This was the opposite. The parts coming apart, wanting to function independently. Mr. Mayer had had a lot of time to think about this. He'd been stuck in his home for over a year now, in his bed for the last three months. He couldn't go anywhere outside, because his organs wouldn't cooperate. They found ways to inflict crippling pain, or they'd suddenly void his pants, or create hours-long erections. Any autonomic function was fair game at this point. They didn't trust him any longer. He tried to modify his diet to appease them, taken drugs to calm them, but it was too late. They'd had a vote of no confidence in him. But his body wasn't a democracy. They couldn't impeach him, but that didn't mean they would just sit around and take it. <sighs> They're trying to figure out how they can do it on their own, he told me, laughing at the idea. Stupid, really. They can live on their own. 
were not designed for it, even in their current state. But they still think it. I know I can't make them happy, but what they want to do is suicide. Even the ones that might live more than a few minutes will be fair game for the microbes, the elements, the predators. They can't feed themselves. They can barely move on their own. They don't get how interdependent they are. How much they need me, need each other. He groaned for a while after that, his on-call attendant coming into the room and administering pain medication into his IV line. His stomach was too unreliable for anything oral. Oh, I swear that his body appeared to be bulging out in several places the whole time, only returning to normal after the medication kicked in. The medication seemed to help somewhat, but the attendant was now arguing for me and Jenny to leave him and let him rest. Mr. Mayer spoke up and contradicted her, eventually sending her from the room. His voice seemed more strained than before, though his eyes still addressed me with barely veiled disdain. You know what? What really sucks in all this? He said. It's not that I don't know what did this to me. I don't think I'm any different from the poor slob that gets crushed by a falling cinder block at a construction site. And it's not that I blame God for having a sick sense of humor. I won't point blame in that direction. Though he might very well, very well be culpable. No. The worst part is that I'm... He convulsed again. His teeth mashed together so hard a crowbar couldn't have parted his jaws. The bulges returned on his sides below his ribcages and up towards his diaphragm. I watched horrified, as they pushed out one inch, two, three, four, stretching his flesh and skin without mercy. But even through all that, he hadn't touched the attendant's call button in his left hand. I knew something was about to transpire, and I really didn't want to be in the room when it happened. It was too far out of my job description, and I didn't owe the man any loyalty. I got up and said I was going to get the attendant, but he adamantly refused and waved me back down. Shaken by the man's pain and strife, I obeyed, despite my better judgment. The worst part is having to live my last moments like this, Mr. Mayer said at last, despite the fact that the bulges in his torso hadn't receded. I had family. I pushed them away. Now all I have left is the public record. Well, I know what everyone will be talking about tonight. You see, I... I stopped taking my tranquilizers days ago. After I made my deal with your manager. I'm tired of holding back the tide. I'm tired of playing nice with... With a society that doesn't know how good they have it. Yeah, tonight, you see your future... I've been keeping them at bay, but I can't. God damn, I've always had good timing. Jenny was still taping the whole thing, but she let the camera drop right around the point she began to scream. So, there isn't much to see on the video except the aftermath, when I picked up the camera after Jenny had run from the mansion. Everything else I recite here is from memory. Mr. Mayer didn't scream. I don't think he could. He simply stared up at the ceiling, his mouth hideously agape. The bulges receded slightly, and then expanded outward at three times their previous rate. Once. Twice. Three times they receded and expanded, like he'd swallowed a pack of living battering rams that were now trying to escape. And escape they did. One bulge erupted, the sheets on top flooding with blood and flopping organs. Then the other two bulges went a moment later, a torrent of crimson liquid and flesh saturating his bed. The sheets were suddenly full of erratic movement, as if a school of live fish had just materialized under the covers. Mr. Mayer's face went rigid, his eyes stiff and sightless, yet it wasn't completely motionless. Something seemed to be crawling around inside his open mouth. 
something wet and unidentifiable. I don't remember much more about that moment. I know I backed up to Jenny's spot. My eyes riveted to the scene before me and found her missing in action. My reporter instincts kicking in where my sanity was lacking, I picked up the camera and continued recording. I recorded the attendant coming in, screaming and crying hysterically. I recorded what was later identified as Mr. Mayer's large intestine attempting to slither away onto the floor, getting only part of the way off the bed before going motionless. And I recorded what was probably his vocal cords poking out of his mouth, fighting to free themselves of their old master. They're all dead, incidentally. The organs, I mean. Every mobile organ that escaped Mr. Mayer's body that day died within minutes. No matter how much they'd changed, no matter how independent they thought they were, they weren't cut out to survive alone. It was only weeks after Mr. Mayer's very graphic demise that other cases began to crop up. Thanks to my news report, people began to fill the hospitals, worrying about the slightest movement in their organs. Most were false alarms, but a few were genuine. Every week, the number of genuine cases increased. There were people from all over the country, with all sorts of lifestyles and backgrounds and racial characteristics. People that were unconnected to Mr. Mayer in any capacity were coming down with the same symptoms. Mayer Syndrome was the official title. There was no common factor, no way to predict it, and no treatment that worked. I used to keep track of the fatalities. I stopped after I became aware of my own situation. Too depressing a thought, really. So far, three and a half years after Mr. Mayer's death, there have been over a hundred people dying from Mayer Syndrome. There's even an underground video circulating that shows the more spectacular endings. The victim's organs scampering around like river dancers until they finally expire. <laughs> I guess there's a market for anything these days. There are thousands more with a condition in our country, and who knows how many are like me, hiding their symptoms or unaware of their condition. The medical community says that it's not communicable, at least not in a way that we understand. But Americans can be a panicky bunch. Just ask any Japanese American that lived through World War II. The government is quarantining anyone with the symptoms. They're cramming people into subpar shelters and close quarters just to keep the populace from going crazy and killing the victims. But the new ones keep coming in. And every week, some maniac up and murders someone they self-diagnose with Mayer Syndrome, accurate or not. No one has survived longer than two years, well, according to the authorities. I like to think that there's someone like me out there that has had it longer. I have to believe it, because the alternatives don't please me at all. I don't know how much stock to place in Mr. Mayer's theories. He was no doctor, certainly not a scientist, and had become a rather jaded man before he died. From what I know of scientific theory, evolution doesn't just spontaneously incur inside an organism. There is some kind of mutation, an alteration of small but significant degrees, not fatal enough to destroy me outright, but fatal enough over time. Chemicals, unusual radiation, toxins, <laughs> Victoria's secret underwear, something has to be triggering this. It's widespread and specific in its attributes, but still only a mutation. I spend more and more of my energies trying to keep the peace within me as the days go on. I wish I could communicate to my unhappy components the uh, bigger picture, that either we all work together or we all die alone. But even if we could communicate, how do you find common ground? A pancreas has a hard time relating to a liver. The heart will always have an insufferable ego as it's well aware of its importance. Hell, the kidneys are practically the same, and yet they keep finding reasons to hurt each other. I've never realized how much of a dictatorship the human body truly is until now. Everything obeys the mind unquestioningly, 
They have to. It's the only way it works. Dissent cannot be allowed. Awareness cannot be allowed. A perfectly running organism is the perfect example of tyranny. I'm going to last as long as I can. I've only had this for a few months and I can already feel the turmoil within me. But I'm going to try. There has to be a way to live in peace with all your bits and pieces. I don't want to believe that awareness is a bad thing, that my heart and lungs can't learn to tolerate each other, or that my stomach will always be a selfish creature. I don't want to believe that the end result is self-destruction. Yes, I'm going to try. But I'm keeping a loaded gun handy regardless. In case some nut job finds out about me, or the police come to collect me, or my body finally decides to start a revolution. If that happens, then I abdicate the throne. I'd rather not witness the ensuing carnage. Wish me luck. I'm going to need it. So what on earth was that all about? Well, have you ever heard a story like that before? Well, quite original, I think. And um, really, really enjoyed doing that one. Uh, thoughts and feelings in the comment section below as ever, and I will do my best to uh, reply and join the chat as much as I can. On vacation for a couple of weeks now, so should be able to join the chat a lot more than I have been recently. That's my hope anyway. Well, my dear friends, you know, as ever, I will be back again very, very soon on Friday night. So. Hope you're all going to join me again. Of course you are, yes, I know you will. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so... Come check me out, okay?